Song 153, we're going to begin with the chorus as we did, um, as we will in our next song. We're going to sing, Lord, I need you. We are thankful for the fact that, the God, that God gives us help and that when we acknowledge our need for him, that he helps us. Let's sing it out on the chorus. And blessings flood my way. I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward with words you long to hear. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you. When the wind is blowing strong, weather trials come or cease, keep me Lord, help me to remember I'm weak, but you are strong. I cannot sing apart from you, for Lord, you are my song. Although I'm prone to wander and boast in all I do, turned upward so I depend on you Lord I need you when the sea of life is calm oh Lord I need you when the wind is blowing strong weather trials come or cease keep me singing. You may be seated. All right, let's be uh, praying for our uh, Christian brothers around the world, especially in Canada, as they, uh, several now, I know four pastors that have been arrested for uh, gathering together and meeting together, and um, uh, these men took stands, the church took stands as well together to uh, say that we're going to meet and we're going to gather. In fact, I uh, was on the internet last night looking at a couple comments, and uh, one of them said they're going to meet anyways, of course. They're going to meet uh, privately, away, even if they have to in the woods. What a great joy and privilege we have that we can still gather today. Um, I would exhort you not to take the Lord's Day so casually. We might not have it one day where we can gather in a building like this. We might be meeting in the woods or in someone's basement, because we will not be able to publicly meet. I would say that the Bible does tell us that on the first day of the week, we are to gather together to fellowship, apostles' doctrine, uh, prayer, and the Lord's table. Don't take it lightly. Don't allow anything. 
to step in the way of the gathering of us together on the first day of the week. Make that a priority. Not to have more favor with him, but because he's given you so much. And he commands that. Nothing, anything, family, nothing should stand in the way of being the gathering together around the Lord's um, a time on the first day of the week. And so let's, um, fortunately in America, we still have that privilege, but I could see just by watching what's happening around the world that that is something that they would like to eliminate here, and that is the preaching, the public preaching of God's word, the public preaching of God's word. And so I hope that you will take that to heart. Well, next week uh, there will be around 26 visitors. So uh, bring both hands because you'll be greeting with both hands. And we'll have uh, 26 young men from Neighborhood Bible Time. That's including the staff here next week. They'll be singing for us. And you'll get a chance to meet them if you can come to Sunday school at 9 o'clock. Each one of them will give a little testimony about where they're from and why they're traveling this summer. And so that will be a great joy to have them. But right now I'm going to have uh, Colton. Why don't you come on up here? Colton is traveling with us. You have not met him before. And he's going to just introduce himself and just talk a little bit about maybe your salvation or whatever you'd like to, okay? Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Colton Peck. I was born and raised on a small farm in Indiana, a town of about 800 people, very tiny, very small. We had to travel 20 minutes to get to the nearest Walmart, if that gives you an idea. But um, we were raised there. I had three siblings and a uh, good Christian home. We went to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I'm thankful my parents raised me. They homeschooled us. They took the time. My mom sat down every night with us, and she trained, told, taught us the whole ver chapter of John 3 from the first verse to the last. I don't remember it all now because it's been a long time. But when I was probably about eight, I could quote that whole chapter. And she went through, and she, we went through the entire chapter every night, and she taught us, and she prayed with us. And I remember when I was five years old, my sister was talking about when she got saved, and she was telling me about it. And I knew I didn't need to have it. And so I went and I knocked beat on the bathroom door while my mom was taking a shower. And I told her I needed to get saved. And she told me, she's like, one second, can you let me get out of the shower first? And I kept beating on the door until she got out of the shower and out of the bathroom. And she took me and she told me how to get saved. But I didn't really remember any of it. And um, about two years later, I, I doubted it. and I couldn't remember it. It was, I was too young. I know where I was, but that was it. And I don't really remember anything else. But when I was seven years old, I was, taking, I was talking to my mom about it, and I was talking about hell and how I was scared of going there. I didn't want to go there. So we went up in my bedroom, and I remember everything. I remember the day. I remember what I was wearing. And we went through it, and she sat down, and I just remember crying, crying, crying. And so she showed, I, she showed me how to get saved, and it was that night, and October 2nd in 2011, I actually got saved, and I know that was when the Lord saved me. And so I just grew up plain, you know, average kid, trouble. But um, <laughs> grew up, and especially when you're on a farm, there's so much to do. So when I got 16 last year, I had a very large event that changed my entire life for what I do believe was good, but I didn't seem good at the time. Everything went, seemed like it was going crazy. And my brother actually came to college. And I didn't know what God wanted me to do. I considered just, I didn't know what to do. I, I was having a really hard time. And I, was, I wasn't living, I was a little bit backslidden in my heart. I wasn't reading my Bible as much as I should have. And I just, I began praying about it because I didn't know what to do. And I talked to my pastor about it and he said, I think you should go to college at Fairhaven because he said staying at home is not going to be good for you. And so I talked to him about it. I talked to my old pastor about it. And he, he has been the most biggest encouragement in my life. And he told me, he said, I think it's a good idea, but I want, I'm going to pray about it. And I want you to pray about it too. And we'll get back later and talk about it. So when we got back later and talked about it, we both said, I think God wants me to go to Fairhaven. So then... Uh, their empowered youth came, and their, it's just their youth conference there, and I visited, and I was talking to 
Brother Ramos, he works a lot with the teenagers there. And I told him, I said, I know God wants me to come here. But I said, but this week, I feel like God wants me to come here this spring, not next fall. And he said, okay, well, you, you could do that. He said, but um, I said, but I don't have a job right now. I don't have any money. I said, will you pray that I can get a job? And he said, well, okay, uh, I'll do that. And he said, hopefully soon God will give you a job, even though, because where we live, there's not a lot of jobs around. And the next day, I had a job. The very next day, um, where my sister worked, they needed someone to hire for just two months' time, part-time for Christmas help for washing dishes at $10 an hour. And so I got a job there. I got the money. I came to college. And God worked everything out. And I heard about Bible, heard Bible times from my brother. He told me about it because he was planning on traveling, even though he's not this year. And so that's where I learned about neighborhood Bible times. So I will be traveling this summer. And um, that's just me and what God's been working in my life. And so thank you. Amen. All right. We're excited about all the young men. They all have stories just like you do. Somewhere along life's journey, they came to know Christ and now they want to give their life back to the Lord. And so we're thankful for that. Now I'm going to have the two young guys uh, jump over there and grab the books and hand them out to each lady in here, uh, if you would, the adult ladies. Um, this is a gift from us to you uh, to just tell you Happy Mother's Day. We're so thrilled that uh, we can do that. So, men, if you'll just pass those out uh, to all the ladies, just lay them next to them if they're busy doing anything. You have one up here, too. Don't forget Miss Eve. And that's for you. It's a little study out of the book of Hebrews. And I hope it will be an encouragement to you. And thank you for all that you do. All that you do. They say that if you are uh, raising kids, you should make in today's wages about $150,000 a year in the amount of time that you pay. that. Now, that does not include pain and anguish. And if you add all that in, then it is quite a bit more. But we're so thrilled for that. All right, Mr. Tim, you come. We have one more announcement. Um, the Bible says in Jeremiah, um, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And I'd like to ask Miss Harmony to come up to the front. Um, we have an announcement, which is that, um, I'll, I'll wait for her to get up there. We believe as Christians that life begins at conception. So we believe that Harmony is already a mother and this is her first Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you guys. We, we love you. We're so thankful that you guys are excited for us. Um, and we're looking forward to Baby Raymaker coming middle of November. Middle of November. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, let's stand together. We have one more song. We're going to sing You Are My All in All, starting with the chorus again. Before we begin, I would like to uh, make a reminder. With this song, there is a little break after what seems to be the first note, and then we go into You Are My Strength. So it might feel a little awkward, but as we learn it this month, you will, you will catch on. So let's stand together. Song 583 in your hymnals. Song number 583, You Are My All in All, beginning with the chorus. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. You are my strength when I am are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God,
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, Great singing, you may be seated. Well, thank you for your love towards uh, the Rainmakers, and what an exciting time for us as a church. Um, a little one, I like when he said that, a little Rainmaker. <laughs> wow. You remember that, right? When you found out the first time, I can remember when we found out that our first one and uh, of course, no cell phone, so we ran to the payphone and uh, called and uh, wanted to tell the world. And it's an exciting, it's an exciting time in the life of, um, of, uh, of for the Rainmakers, and we're so thrilled that we get to have a part of it. It's been very hard to remain quiet. I know some of you uh, uh, knew, uh, just a few of you knew, and uh, there was one here that figured it out, went to her and said, you know, there's a glow about you. And, uh, of course, being a... Uh, being a um, ex expecting mother, she could not say no, <laughs> and uh, that was quite a compliment. Um, in fact, I just wanted to mention this too. Uh, where's Joseph? Joseph, I don't know if you saw this. You ran into uh, Harmony the other day downtown. She had a shirt on that said "Blessed Mom" or "Blessed Mom," and she said, "Oh my goodness, I he saw that. I wonder if he figured out that, but you missed it, no?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she was thinking, oh no, he figured it out. But praise God, it was a guy. <laughs> if it was a lady, this would have been old news by now. But uh, no, in a good way, because mothers know how exciting that is to share it with everyone. <laughs> Oh my goodness, put your foot in your mouth, Larry. <laughs> uh, I just want to tell Tim he's free to name the child Larry if he wants. I mean, you know, if you want, or Nancy, you know, you know either way, we got both names covered. All right, take your Bibles if you would and turn to the book of Proverbs. And whenever we say turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, it reminds us instantly that our message is going to come from the wisest person that ever lived. That's exciting, because uh, God says so, and his wisdom was beyond anything that will ever be, the Lord says. And so when we read the book of Proverbs, it right away tells us that we ought to sit up nice, straight, and tall. We ought to think through what is being said, because the scriptures are God's word for us, and God used Solomon in a great way. So tonight, or today rather, the, the message titled is, The Perfect Gift for Your Mother. I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what to get mom. I know that I was thinking about bringing a bunch of things. I have a bunch of ties and socks that I've gotten over the years and cards and this and that and that for Father's Day. Sometimes it's hard when you're younger to figure out, you know, what is the gift that I can give my mom? Certainly as a mom, if they color a piece of paper, that's sufficient. That right there makes it to the refrigerator. And uh, makes top billing for sure. In fact, uh, we were just with our grandkids uh, yesterday celebrating Mother's Day. And uh, uh, my wife was looking for some paper for uh, Emmy to draw on it. And I uh, found some old papers that had writing on one side. And so then after she left and we were about to, go, to leave, I said, you know, we can go ahead and get rid of that. And no, my wife said, we need to keep that, right? We need to keep it because it's important. It's important to them when they do something like that. And I'm glad uh, that you as children uh, can give your mom a gift. But let me stress once again, this is the perfect gift. See, God proclaims that each day is special. We're not to make one day over another day. 
They're all special in God's eyes. Psalm 118.24, which I think is stated right here, this is the day which the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is that day that the Lord has set aside for the gathering of the saints. That's why we gather today. It's not for the unsaved, it's for the saved. It's for us to come together and praise and worship our Lord. The first day of the week as believers is laid aside from all normal duties and make the gathering or the assembly of ourselves together a priority. We in America have cheapened the importance of this day. This is God's plan. This is God's desire for His children. Make it important and special for your children as well. Today's a special day, too, because we get to honor mothers, reflecting upon this wonderful gift to us. The Bible talks much about the role and the impact of mothers. Uh, it's a lawfully calling especially in the midst of our day when the calling is so demeaned by others. So we need to more than ever to look the way God defines the role of men and women. The hope of motherhood is a God-fearing mother, that a mother would be a God-fearing mother. It is always and it is God's design. The tragedy is this wonderful love is disbarred dis 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 today. Uh, all Christians can fall prey to the world's outlook on motherhood, which is all wrong and backwards, which trivializes this beautiful calling from God. There is no such thing as just a homemaker. There's no such thing as just a stay-at-home mom. It is the highest calling and privilege in God's eyes to be a mother. Thank you, moms. Thank you, moms. It is the highest calling it is a lawfully calling. It is an exalted calling. A mother's love is priceless. You know what that word means. It's priceless. It cannot be bought. Every organization today who derides and who unabashedly moves away from God's norm and demeans it and says it is an infringement on a woman's career and fulfillment are all unscriptural organizations. The roots are deep in satanic thought. Because God holds motherhood in the highest that it can be. It is crucial to your children as well. God says it brings perfect fulfillment being a mother. Because it was his design. Because God always brings perfect contentment and fulfillment when we do things in his order and his way. So let's look at our text this morning and let's take a look. And as we honor our mothers, not just today, but every day, but today especially because it is a special day on the calendar as well. Proverbs chapter number 23, if you'll turn there, Proverbs chapter 23, and we're going to start in verse number 22. Verse number 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. I really like that video. Did you see the progression of life? Because her son honored her in that video. When she began to get old, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, I watched the video more and more times than you did, she was in a wheelchair. She was at a time of her life where she couldn't run around and do all those things that she used to be able to do. But yet you saw the honor of the son to the mother. And that is because... He had a God-fearing mother that looked to the scriptures. So hearken unto thy father, and begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous shall, great, shall greatly rejoice, and he that uh, begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bare thee shall rejoice. What a promise that a mother can rejoice even as her body is failing. Even though she can't do the things she used to do in her old age, her children can bring such gladness and rejoicing to her spirit. As the woman in the video looked at her son and said, I knew you'd be a good dad. I knew you'd be a good father. And then we see later in the video, we see the, the son saying, Mom, even when I didn't want you around, you were still there. Even when I didn't like what you were saying, 
I'm glad you were there. What a touching moment. And a touching moment each one of us can have with our children as, as well. So our points today are be reminding. Be reminding. And our second point is be remembering. Be remembering. And our third point is be rejoicing. Be rejoicing. So our first thought today is be reminding. Be reminding. The Bible tells us once again in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. When the Bible uses the word despise in our text, it means to disrespect. We should never disrespect our parents, have contempt for them. If you do not honor your mother, you are in direct violation of God's will. So if you're here today and your mother is still alive, whether you are grown up and out of the home and have your own children and maybe your own grandchildren, we are still to honor our parents. We are, if not, we're in direct violation of God's will. In fact, our text tells us as your mother ages, you will actually despise her. You will not want to take care of her. She'll be a burden and like a millstone around your neck if you do not learn to honor them now and love them now. Commandment number five says, Honor thy father and mother. Your mother's love for you is special. I hope you've realized that. Your mother's love is intimate, special, and unique. A mother's heart overflows with love to her children, with unconditional love. Aren't you glad that your mother loved you through those very, very rough, difficult times in your life? It's an unbought love and an unselfish love. A mother has constant concern for her children. She nurses her children in times of sickness if she has the fear of the Lord. If, if, if she, if she, if she uh, understands the importance of motherhood, she counsels her child in times of difficulties. Even when a child causes difficulty, that child is worth to that mother more than anything they can buy. Her children are an extension of her. As you get older, you will find, you might not like this comment, but as you get older, you will find that you will do and act a lot like the influence your mom had upon you. You will say things that they said. You will act on some of the things that you remember about your mom. If you break your mother's heart to pieces, you will lose that closeness and relationship. There's no doubt about that. But you can never change her love for you. It will always remain. Your mother will always love you. We see this truth of a God-fearing mother's heart played out in 1 Kings chapter 3 where Solomon is about to take a sword to divide the child in half because they can't determine which one's the mother. And so Solomon says, give me a sword then, I'll divide the baby in half, I'll give half to this woman and half to this woman. But the real mother says, no way, give her the whole child because death would be too much. I would rather somebody else raise her and everybody that think it's her child than for me to see my child split in half or injured. See, the true mother cannot bear it and is willing to give her child up so it can even live. The Bible presents that motherhood as something beautiful. Motherhood's beautiful. I don't care what the world says. You can be completely fulfilled in motherhood because that is God's plan. He says way back in Genesis, multiply, be fruitful and multiply to have children. And so God would not tell us something like that if he could not fulfill us in it. It is something dynamic. It is something that represents the favor of God and the blessing of God. Progressive sanctification is finding out what God says and to do it. And God says, motherhood and moms, stay at it. It's worth it. It's a blessing. It's a joy. It's a trial. It's all the emotions that can possibly be. But if you will be a God-fearing mother, your children will be God-fearing. And one day when you are old and you are not able to take care of yourself, they will be there for you. So am I preaching against nursing homes? Of course not. 
There are times that we are not able in our own strength to pick somebody up, to take care of medicine and those type of things. And so the care is there. What we're talking about is that we would honor them even when they are there in a nursing home, so to say, because of the desperate care that is needed that you cannot provide for them. The Bible says in Psalm 123, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. So it's a reward to be a steward, to mother, and to train your child. Mothers, train God-fearing children. I love what Colton said up here, that his mom spent time with him every day to instill in him John chapter 3, that he would understand that. And here he is years later, and he remembers that, and it's dear to his heart, and it's important. Sacrifice your time for them. It will be worth it. It's more valuable, you see, because God's design for the family unit is to be unbreakable in the most difficult of times. In the security at all ages of your family, youngest to oldest is protected by the family unit. If we raise them to be God-fearing, they'll be there for us in those moments. As we get older or a child that is sick, the family can rally around together to protect one another. May I say, children that are younger here, that are here with us today, you are around her often, and you can take her for granted. Don't take your mother for granted. Don't do that. Young person, you are to have the utmost respect and love for your mother. You are to worship the ground that she walks on, not above God, but in the position and the authority that she carries. Dads, you can help this by letting them know that they can never repay all that she gives to them to build your wife up in front of them. Mothers work tirelessly for their children. I, I kind of like that because he's knocking on the door and she says, hey, listen, I'm in the shower. <laughs> and he just keeps knocking. And that's the way it is with a mom. Your time becomes their time. Your emergency's their emergency. Did you see that commercial one time where the, the mother wants to eat some candy? So she gets her, her, her protecting candy and she, she hides in a closet. And she's in there just enjoying the cookie. I guess that's the commercials about the cookie. And all of a sudden, these little hands come underneath the door. Mom, mom, are you in there? There is no rest and no time as a mom, is it not? It is tireless, but it is worth it. It is worth it to raise a child who is God-fearing, a child who will honor you and make the right decisions. It's so important. So mothers, raise a God-fearing child and children uh, and fathers Raise your wife and your mother up in their eyes. They should hear you never deride them. Mothers work tirelessly. It, it is not just the hours, it's the love. It's the commitment, the prayer. The heart of the mother is beyond price. There's no one who can take the place of your mom. Think about that. There is nobody that can take the place of your mom. Your mom is special. Your mom is a gift from God. How wonderful is that? Your mom is incredibly special. God also calls you to obey her and respect her. Obey her promptly, sweetly, and completely. When she gets older and you grow up, keep honoring her. Do not despise your mother, the text says. This is God's way. What a tragedy it is to despise your mother. Husbands, are you honoring your wives the way uh, your children can see that? Are you, are you communicating to them that their mom is special? If you take her for granted, so will the children, and so will they to their spouses one day. Send an example high, husbands. Set the bar way up there. Every mother desires her children would love God supremely then you can give her the greatest gift. Yes, that monetary gift's important to them. 
They enjoy that. They enjoy opening that present. They enjoy getting a card. They enjoy getting that present. But ultimately, what your mom wants from you is that you would honor her and that you would love her and that you would carry out God's will and obey her by God's grace, of course. And the second is, is, is be, rem be remembering. Not only are we to, be, uh, to, to uh, honor them, but we're to be remembering. So how do we do this? How do we honor our parents? Well, our text tells us in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, it says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Truth is mentioned often in the Proverbs. It's mentioned quite a bit. Our text says, buy the truth. Our text uses the word truth, so we need to understand what truth means in our text. It means to the full scope of biblical truth, the whole counsel, the revelation of all of God's will. This would include doctrinal truth and law and grace. It includes experiential truth that lies within the believer by the Holy Spirit. It includes practical truth by fearing God, which is the beginning of wisdom and ultimately all truth. The culmination of all truth and the way of truth is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's saying here is, listen, uh, get truth, understand the scriptures, understand what God says, and if you are a child that fears the Lord, if you are a son or daughter that fears the Lord, you will not have a problem honoring your parents. Because the scriptures is filled that no matter what kind of mom we have, no matter what kind of dad we have, we are still to honor them. We are still to love them. And we are still to treasure them regardless. And unless we're in the scriptures and being remembered to be in them, we will not have that type of heart. The Bible has declared in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, it says, And we know that the Son of God has come, and have given us an understanding that we may know that that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we read his word, we get truth. And when we get truth, we can apply it. And when we apply truth, our relationships with one another will work their way out because this relationship will be right. And we're to have that type of foundation so we can honor our parents. It's just not the moms. We're to honor our fathers and our mothers. Our text, our text says we need to buy truth. The word buy is not like how we go and buy items at the store. To buy truth means to erect or to get something, especially after an effort. So it takes effort to get truth. It takes effort to study the word. It takes effort to apply it, to attain it, to possess it, to redeem it. We must evaluate it. We must value it. We must appropriate it. We must love it. We must like it. We must depend upon it. We must memorize it. We must meditate upon it. It is to be practiced. It is to be rejoiced in. It is to be maintained. It is to be contended for. It must be our life. Buy truth and sell it not. So if you're in here today and you're struggling with those relationships at home, then get truth. Get in the scriptures and understand God's order and, and how your parents are a gift to you at all ages. Even if your parents are in their 80s or 90s, we are to still honor them. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 says this, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. God's truth has been tempered. It is real. You can believe it, and it will change you. He's saying, buy of me, and you'll rejoice. And your mother's heart will rejoice. I'm glad that my wife has a relationship with both of her daughters. I am glad that in, in, the, in the trials and tribulations of our daughters not being perfect and us not being perfect, my wife has loved them through some of the most difficult times of their life. 
And she has stuck with it. And because of that, I watched my daughter honor her this past weekend. Even to the fact that she didn't call me and ask me if I wanted bed, uh, breakfast in bed. She called me to ask me what I thought mom wanted to have in bed. This is the hope of every God-fearing mother that you'll buy truth. That your life will be so saturated in the scriptures that you would never sell it, you would never change it, and you would never leave it. That's the greatest gift you can give your mom is a life wholly given over to the Lord and that she can enjoy watching you carry the torch long after she is gone. Jesus says the same thing. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, he says again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, that which a man hath found it, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, that he may buy that field. So when we find truth and we see that it works and that God is in it, then sell all you have, get rid of anything that's unimportant, and make sure you have truth. And this word is truth. Don't disregard the scriptures. Don't disregard the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but get truth. To buy truth is to believe in the truth. You must believe that the scriptures are true and that they are for us. It is to bow under the spirit of truth, to humble ourselves and say, oh God, teach me, show me. How can I love my mom? How can I respect my dad? How can I be the child that I need to be at all ages, whether you're five years old or whether you are 55 or even older, that we can honor them? God's truth is always convicting and liberating because of Christ's work on the cross. And as it transforms you to live that truth, others see it. To buy this kind of truth is, is not something I buy with money. It is bought by faith. God, I believe your scriptures to be true. And by faith, I am going to follow the precepts and the truth of the scriptures. I believe the whole body of truth. There is no inherency in the scriptures. All 66 love letters are given to us by the Holy Spirit, and we have them to change us into the image of our Son, our dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that have no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's what Isaiah was saying to Israel. He said, listen, you don't need any money to come back to me. You don't have to do anything but just humble yourself and come back and I will give you the fat of the land. I will give you milk and honey. I will give you truth so that you can honor me. And in honoring me, you will honor those that are around you. So how do you buy something without money? I'd like to do that. Well, you seek truth earnestly. You seek it by using the means God gives you uh, to find truth. That's the scriptures. Faithful church attendance. Bible study. Reading the scriptures. Fellowshipping with God's people. Prayer. Memorizing God's word. Meditating upon God's word. Reading good Christian literature. And of course, the Lord's table. A time of remembrance of how God gave so much for us. Are you doing these? Are you memorizing scripture? Are you meditating upon it? Are you putting it first in your life? These are the means that God provides that you will find truth. Are you doing this? If not, you will find untruth. And that's why there's such a misconception today on the roles of the family. The roles of the women, roles of the men, roles of the children. It is all mixed up because we are not looking for truth. And so we are believing the ridiculous uh, formation that is out there today that says what the role of a man is and what a role of a woman is. You seek truth perpetually. It never stops. It never ends. You can never know all the truth that God has for you this side of heaven. You never get done pursuing truth. 
Children, you want to give your mom a gift, no matter how old your mom is? Pursue truth. Seek after it. Keep growing in your Christ likeness. That will make her heart more joyful than any tangible gift, uh, something bought that you can give her. One has stated that we often find ourselves in fits and starts, cold one day and hot the next. One has said, we off, I mean, um, it says, those who do not continue to grow will find themselves driven by emotions. One day they're very happy, and the next day they're in the dumps. They live in past victories. Have you ever met anybody? They only talk about the past? Oh, in the past, then it was glorious. Today it's not. Well, is God dead? God's alive. Today can be as glorious and more glorious than it was 20 years ago to live in the past. And to talk about that is ridiculous. It just shows that you're not growing anymore. You're not, you're not getting God's word because God always keeps us in the now and now. We can be just as excited today as the past. God is working. Don't miss that. Souls are being saved. People need discipled. There is great hope in the future because God's in charge. You seek truth no matter what the cost. Seeking truth, there's a cost to it. On one side, the cost is free because the blood of Jesus Christ is free. All can be saved. Anybody in here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior can come to faith. Christ died for all. He died for you. He died for me. He died for every person. He died for even the ones that will reject Him and go to a hell because of their rejection. On the other side, truth is very expensive because buying truth will cost you the pride of your heart. You'll have to humble yourself. It may cost you some friends that you ought really not to have. It will cost you to move away from the worldly activities that we've allowed into our life. It will cost you your own will for God's will. You will have to deny yourself and take up the cross daily, maybe even unto death. A man named Joseph Hall said in a concise statement, the truth did cost Elijah danger. When Elijah decided to do right, it cost him. His life was in danger. The truth did cost Mordecai disgrace for a period of time. The truth cost Jeremiah to be imprisoned. And truth cost the, apost the apostles to be martyrs. And if you take a stand in today's day and age, for what is right and what is wrong, you're going to be derided. You're not going to be on the front page of the paper. You are not going to have the high job. You are going to have to take a stand for what is wrong by taking a stand for truth. So how much do you value truth? Are you buying truth and refusing to sell it? I know you're willing to give some time to buy truth. You being here proves that you are willing to give something for truth. But we're to give all, everything, and we're not to sell it. We're not to give it away. See, when we neglect the things of God, we sell truth. When we choose openly to reject what God tells us that we know is right, such as honoring your mother and honoring your father, and we choose not to do it, then we sell truth. We make truth not important. See, Demas sold the truth for a worldly life. He said, you know what? I'm not going to live for the Lord. I'm going to go do my own will, whatever I want to do. He sold truth. Judas sold truth for 30 pieces of silver and his own soul. Esau sold the truth for a morsel of food. He gave up all the promises for just food because he was hungry. He couldn't hold back his own appetite. The double-minded man sells it for a double life. You might be one way here, but a different way there. And that's selling truth. Are you selling truth? Or are you buying truth? Be reminded be remembering, and the results will be glad and rejoicing. And so our last point is, be rejoicing. There is no greater joy than to see your children rise up and honor their mother. 
There's no greater joy than to see that. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 23, 24, and 25 say, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. So when a child is living right, a father gets excited. He sees that and he says, that's my son, that's my boy. And he rejoices to see that they are God-fearing. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. But in verse number 25, the father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that beareth thee shall rejoice. When a child honors their mother, when a child buys truths and sells it not, a mother's heart is exalted and she rejoices. If you do these things, you will bring great rejoicing to your parents. Your mother shall be glad, the text says. She will rejoice. She'll be exalted. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 1, it says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Do you see the opposite? If we'll just give our life to the Lord, that we'll be God-fearing, and that we'll follow His precepts and His truth, it will bring honor to your mother and great joy as well. See, that is when you mature and you're wise, you will cause your parents to have a heart that is glad. Parents, have patience with your kids during these ages. There's a lot of foolishness that's going on. There's a lot of back and forth and a tugging as they get their feet and they get their strength and, and they're trying to figure out their independence and their dependence and they're working through that. Stay with them. There are ups and downs. There are great trials. There are disappointments at time. But you stay at it because if they buy truth, they will honor you, but more importantly, they'll honor your God. So when they're mature and wise, you will cause your parents to have a heart that is glad and that their lives will be easy and comfortable in their old age by living soberly and righteously and behaving wisely, by not only honoring them, but by seeking the honor and the glory of God as well. And the Bible says that then she that bear thee will rejoice. Your mother, uh, particularly, who bore and brought birth and birthed you into this world through so much pain and brought you up with so much time and love and care and trouble, will receive her greatest joy by her child who fears the Lord. So fear the Lord. That's the key of the whole, of honoring our parents is to have the right fear of the Lord. I find this one of the most touching areas of Scripture. Certainly, the one that we want to look to as our example is always Christ. And here we have two passages that show us how Christ responded uh, to his mother. So take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to John chapter 19, and in verses 26 and 27. They're very touching Scriptures. Very touching. Now you have to remember that Jesus Christ is on the cross. He is bearing the sins of the whole world. His hands and his feet are nailed to the cross. He's been beaten to the point where he's unrecognizable. It pleased the Lord to bruise him for our iniquities. He's on there as the lamb in the butcher shop. He's unrecognizable. He must be in so much pain physically, but not only physically, but his father is about to turn his back on him because all the sins of the world are going to be upon him. So just try to picture what is taking place here as we're going to look up to the cross from the position that his mother Mary was at as she took a glance at him and what Jesus, in the midst of all that he was going through, takes notice of his mother takes notice of his mother and he says here in these two scriptures he says when Jesus therefore saw his mother so from the cross with all that we just talked about of, of the lovely Savior hanging naked in front of the whole world on a on a on a piece of wood that the Bible says is cursed dying in your place and my place, demonstrating his love for us. He takes notice of his mom. 
And the disciple standing by, who was John, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Well, what does that mean? What is contained in that phrase, behold thy son? What, what he is saying, he said, that promise, way back in Luke, when Simeon held me in the air and, 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 the, and the old woman held me and, and the promise was that the spear and the sword would pierce your son. Ma, because of you, I am here. And her mom was very, very rejoicing because this was the redemption of the world. This was the redemption where her son carried out the will of God. And nothing can make a mom more rejoicing and glad than to see their children walk in truth. And so from the cross, he sees her and he acknowledges her and she looks upon him and with great rejoicing, she sees that her son carried out the Lord's will. Then said he to the disciple, so he goes on, hanging on the cross, barely recognizable. He says, Behold thy mother. He was saying at that time, Behold the son, behold me. But then he says, he says Behold thy mother, take care of her. He didn't leave her comfortless. He said, John, I'm, I'm entrusting to you. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And so not only did he accomplish God's will, but part of God's will was to take care and honor his mother all the way to the end because Joseph, the father, is dead by now. And what a touching, touching moment that must have been for Mary. Her heart broken, but yet rejoicing because her son followed the father's will. Children, parents, that have parents living, today's your day. You get to honor your parents. You get to make that phone call. No matter what the relationship is, and some of them are difficult. There's some real difficult relationships out there. Not all moms and dads have done what they were supposed to do. But you're to honor them anyways. And call them today. Let them know that you love them. If you do. And to greet them as well. And that's the greatest gift that you can give to your parents today is a God-fearing heart. One that would obey the Scriptures supremely, not out of duty, but out of the great gift of salvation. So, mothers, thank you for all you do. I can't imagine. Uh, I always felt that I got away with it, being the father. They're, they're, my wife, she stood in the gap. I know that every husband feels this way about their mother. I feel my, my wife was, was the greatest mother that ever lived. And I know you feel that way about your spouse and the way they raise their kids. And so I exhort you to love your children, stay with them. And children, respect and love your parents and have a God-fearing heart and honor them all the way to the end, whether they're in their 90s or whether they're in their 30s or 20s, honor them, honor them. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Now the word has been preached, and so now it resides in our hearts. What will we do with it? We will reject it, or we will make decisions that need to be made. And so with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, children and parents and ones that have their parents alive, what changes do you need to make so that you can honor your parents? What are those things that, that need to be worked in your own heart? And then maybe you're here today and you're not born again. You do not know Jesus as your Savior. What are you waiting for? Today's the day that you need to come and receive Christ as your Savior. Would you come? Would you be willing to come and know him? know him. Maybe you're here and everybody thinks you're saved. Maybe you're here and you're not sure if you're saved. Maybe you know you're not saved and you need to come and trust the Lord. You do that as 
Miss Eve already up here. I turned my back and she creeped up there. As she gives the music here, think upon your heart. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Whatever that is, do it. Do it. Come, if you need to be saved, come. You can't change the past. And God doesn't want us to live in the past but you can change the future. You can change going forward. You can change it. God will give you the grace. Play through one more time, Miss Eve. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, do the happy dance around uh, uh, Harmony and Tim, and uh, they'll be hearing the happy dance soon. <laughs> In November, they'll hear the pitter-patter of those steps running around the house, and uh, they'll be chasing them around, and uh, they'll go through everything that you did. <laughs> and uh, um, Lord willing, that child will get saved at an early age and give their life to the Lord, and that's what we want for our children, too, as well. And as I look around this room, I've watched some of you take care of your parents in older age, and you have been remarkable, and you know who I'm talking about. I have watched you labor and take care of your parents um, unselfishly, and thank you for that. What an example for us to see here at uh, Faithway Baptist Church. All right, well, enjoy one another, and um, children, go home and wrap up the fear of God and hand it to your mom. <laughs> Have a good day.